Great, welcome everybody. I'm Sean Struve. I'm the mayor of Milford and the organizer of these panels today at the church. And I'm really grateful for everyone spending part of their Sunday with us uh, for what I know is going to be a really interesting panel. Um, the, I'm going to introduce uh, Krista, and then Krista will introduce our special guest and kick off our discussion today. Uh, I always say that I met Krista Cesaris. Uh, when we were running for the legislature in 2018. 2018, and I went to an event and found the most incredibly prepared first-time candidate I think I'd ever heard. Uh, when I went up and started talking to her, I expected she'd run for office before or work in the legislature or something. Uh, no, uh, she had just listened to Hillary say women need to run for office and went out and, and uh, understood the assignment. <laughs> trainings and did her research and was just an incredibly well-prepared candidate. I, of course, am always hoping we'll get the opportunity to support Krista again for office someday. Uh, but Krista is the president of the Monroe County chapter of the NAACP. Uh, she has been for about two and a half years. She has a BA in jurisprudence and an MS in law and public policy from the California University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she was the first black woman to run for the nomination uh, for the Pennsylvania State House of Representatives from this district and she has been very engaged in supporting and encouraging other qualified women candidates for local and state offices in the Commonwealth. Her advocacy efforts include service in the Board of Directors of the Greater Pike Community Foundation, the Pocono Mountains United Way, Emerge Pennsylvania, and the newly formed Seven Oaks Collective. Uh, she also serves as co-chair of PMUW's the United Way's uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Cohort, uh, maintains a life membership in the NAACP, and is a long member of the longtime member of the Rotary Club of the Stroudsburg, and an active member of the Greater Pocono Chapter of Jack and Jill of America. Uh, last year, she was awarded the MLK Community Member Award from East Stroudsburg University. Uh, and as a childhood survivor of sexual abuse and domestic violence, she's laser focused on these issues affecting women and children. Um, and just a few weeks ago, uh, Krista made history by becoming the chairperson of the Pike County Women's Commission, an advocacy committee focused on the empowerment and education of women and girls. I need to point out, she was not just appointed to that position, she did the work, petitioned the commissioners, explained the need, uh, described the concept, and, uh, 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 and persuaded our commissioners to establish this new group. Um, following calls for reform in law enforcement, uh, Krista formed the Monroe County Community Roundtable, which unites leaders in local and state law enforcement with Monroe County NAACP to find strategic and creative ways to make lasting changes in our community. Uh, Krista's husband and son are here with us today, uh, and they've been residents uh, of Pike County since 2005. So, it is my pleasure to introduce Krista, and a uh, particular pleasure to have our special <coughs> guest with us here here today. Um, I've already died three times. Um, good afternoon. Um, it, is, it is beyond an honor um, to, to, be, to be sitting um, with someone like Paula J. Giddings. Um, her resume is extensive. I can, I can we'd probably be here three more days talking about all, the, all of the wonderful things she has done and crafted and written. Um, but most uh, importantly, she is a professor emeritus of Smith College uh, for African, African Studies. Um, she is the author of When and Where I Stand. Um, and I will let someone in the audience tell us the book that she wrote uh, in honor of the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And that book is In Search of Sisterhood. <laughs> Looks like they found it. <laughs> today, which is an absolute jewel. Um, if you have not purchased it, I highly recommend that you do so. It is something that really should belong, it really belongs on your <clears throat> shelf for a number of reasons, which you will learn about today. Um, I am extremely, extremely excited uh, to be able to talk with Paula, as well as talk about Ida, uh, for a number of reasons. I identify 
with Ida in many ways. Um, her middle name was Belle, um, and she was exactly that. She was a Belle for all of the things that were wrong uh, in America concerning black people and just civil rights and human rights. Um, but I identify with her because not just as a black woman, but just as a woman, we understand how it is to be silenced. We understand how it is to persevere despite many, many obstacles placed before you. Uh, we understand, some, some of us understand what it means to be loud and right, right? <laughs> Sometimes you're loud and wrong, but Ida was always loud and right. Um, and her voice was not always welcomed, but she continued to speak. Um, and that's, that's definitely something that I identify with. So I don't want to talk too much about her because then we would have nothing to discuss. But one of the things, <laughs> yeah, we got to talk about the book. But one of the, no, so it was just a lot of material. You had a to whole lot. Yeah, I think there's like 600 pages of dialogue, and then there's another 200. Don't scare people away. <laughs> no, but really, I mean, this is a woman whose life could, could not be hardly contained, right, mm -hmm. in, in print. And so she's larger than life. Um, you know, all the work that she did. We'll probably never, you know, know all of the passion and all of the reasons behind it. But you know, to have a moment like this to be able to spotlight not just um, Ida, but also the, the genius of Paula Giddings, um, I'm just honored to have this opportunity. Um, what I'd like to do before we begin talking about the book is to give you a little bit of history about Monroe County, um, where a lot of us are from. But first, before I do that, I want to thank a couple of people. I'd like to thank Sean Strew. Uh, Sean, are you here? I don't know if he's still here. Okay, thank you, Sean. Okay, um, certainly thank you. I'd like to thank Mr. Edson Whitney. Head of the Northern Readers and Writers Club. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the women of the East Pocono Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen.
commissioners relieved the guards of their duty, determining the endeavor too expensive. On March 15th, at roughly 7 a.m., Perrier purportedly managed to escape his cell while breakfast was being served in the jailhouse. Kresge instructed a nearby crowd to capture him. Perrier ran <clears throat> south towards McMichael's Creek, where he hoped he could swim to safety. As the growing mob approached the creek, Broadhead Palmer gave a pistol to Benjamin Quentin, another African American, and instructed him to jump in the creek and apprehend Perrier. Exhausted, Perrier <clears throat> surrendered. The crowd secured a rope from a nearby slaughterhouse and without hesitation hung Perrier from a nearby oak tree. Perrier was lynched in the vicinity of the current day ESSA bank headquarters. As was the theme with many American lynchings in the 19th century, a photograph was taken of the scene and turned into a postcard, which I have. I don't have the postcard, but I do have the photograph. These photographs were then sent around the country as novelty items. Constable Lewis Myers arrived on scene and tried to stop the lynching, but was physically restrained by the crowd. Reminds me a little bit of January 6th. <laughs> when Sheriff Kresge arrived on scene, a mock participant reminded the crowd to keep silent and not to reveal the names of those complicit in the murder. Per year's body <laughs> remained hanging from the tree for nearly three hours. That reminds me of uh, Michael Brown. <laughs> Uh, crowds from around Monroe County flocked to Stroudsburg to see the scene. It wasn't until 10 a.m. that county commissioners demanded that Perrier be cut down. Witnesses began collecting souvenirs from the crime. People began chopping limbs off the tree and distributed the pieces as keepsakes. Benjamin Quinton, there's always one of cut the rope into sections, <laughs> and spent the rest of the day selling pieces for 25 cents each. Officials proposed that per year be buried in Stroudsburg Cemetery. Prominent <laughs> townspeople quickly rejected this proposal and denied per year a burial. No one was willing to claim per year's body. The next morning, his body was sent to University of Philadelphia, in, excuse me, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia to be used as a cadaver for medical students, thereby taking away the evidence. A grand jury was formed in Murrow County with the goal of bringing per year's murderers to justice. Each witness who was brought before the grand jury either claimed they were not there or that they did not know the identities of the lynchers. On June 4th, the, the grand jury was brought to a close while per year's murderers were still at large. The only finite action taken by the court was a determination <laughs> that Sheriff Kresge was negligent for allowing per year to escape. And I will end there. <clears throat> so with that backdrop, we will begin. The campaign against lynching. Ida said, one had better die fighting against injustice than to die like a dog or a rat in a trap. Mm -hmm. Lynching. Bodies hung in macabre public museums where white folks would gather, eat, drink, sometimes picnic, and some paid top dollar for souvenirs of death. But much about the lynch remains hidden from the world, their lives, their dreams, their sins, and their last thoughts just before their deaths. Ida said, our country's national crime is lynching. It is not the creature of the hour, the sudden outburst of controlled fury, or the unspeakable brutality of an insane mob. As a young woman in her 20s, Ida understood that lynching was both a, ne a mechanism of control and response to blacks, upward progression by the elites, rather than, what was, rather than what would be considered at that time and even now, poor white, poor white trash, uh, which was the prevailing thought at that time. Can you tell us a little bit about just the history and what Ida believed sparked this rise in lynching, which used to be more Europeans, but then at one point blacks outnumbered. Is, is lynching as American as apple pie? Well, <laughs> thank you for that small question. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that wonderful introduction. Let me first say, I want to say hello to my sorrows who are here. Thank you for coming. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you to Sean. Uh, it's such a wonderful, uh, this is such a wonderful event and so many wonderful things are happening here. 
that uh, is not just you know celebration, but I know it's a symbol of transformation too in this in this area. So it's, it's wonderful uh, to be uh, a part of, of that. And um, I've had a wonderful time. I've uh, stayed with my friend Rose Schwartz, uh, uh, who's here, uh, and uh, who's told me. It, it, a lot of things to say today, so. <laughs> she really helped me out, so. Oh, okay, thank you, Rose. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm to support her. Uh, and, uh, and so, and Krista, it's been wonderful just to be communicating with you and thank talking you. to you. Such and, an honor, my goodness. I know, no, 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 it's such an honor. <laughs> right. But, uh, so I feel very good. It's a, it's a really wonderful, I feel like this is a really wonderful moment. Lynching is so American. It really starts in the American Revolutionary period, uh, <clears throat> at a time um, when you know the, the courts were far, few and far between, uh, and it was really mainly uh, uh, the main victims were people like horse thieves and and others, and of course the enemy sometimes uh, the, the, the British, uh, <clears throat> and it doesn't become lynching doesn't become so it's. it's uh, it doesn't become racialized until uh, after Reconstruction <laughs> and uh, the first idea was to keep blacks from voting, of course, a familiar thing in American history. Uh, this, of course, it's the, it still goes on. Um, uh, and it's not until, Chris, it's not until 1886, this is really interesting, not until 1886 are more black people lynched than whites. So it's I, a thing. It's always been it's, a thing. It's a thing. It's, <laughs> a, it's, it's, it's in the American DNA. Mm -hmm. And then it begins to change and transform again, which we'll talk a little bit more about in Ida, in Ida Wells' time. But she begins the first anti-lynching campaign in 1892 uh, from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, she had been born in Mississippi, uh, born to parents who were enslaved, um, and has a really good start. She has a father who is very political himself and a civic leader. And in fact, when blacks uh, could first vote during Reconstruction, he did, despite the fact that his employer, who was once his mass slave master, right. told him not to vote. But he voted anyway. Uh, uh, and sometimes we forget this, I don't want to go too much into the history, but we forget that black history, <clears throat> ours is a history of not ever ha ever having, but things being taken away all the time. Right. We, we had to vote. And of course, as a result, in a place like Mississippi, you know, we had the black, the black governor, we had a black secretary of state, we, had, we were all voting in Reconstruction. And it was on the vote of black people, of free uh, enslaved persons that made that happen. When uh, Ida's father comes back from, <coughs> from voting, she finds a shop, he, her, her father was a, a talented carpenter uh, who had helped build mansions in Holly Springs. Uh, the man he, he, he worked for was an architect and a designer. We think maybe Ida's father probably did more designs than maybe mm -hmm. men, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so she has this, <coughs> She has a history already of, 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 of resistance. Um, she is orphaned, tragically, at the age of 16 by the yellow fever epidemic. Uh, parents die 24 hours uh, one after the other. And she's responsible for taking care of her four brothers and sisters, she's the oldest, uh, and does so. And finally, an aunt, um, who's also orphan, or aunt who is widowed by the yellow fever epidemic, brings her to Memphis, um, where she is a teacher, which is at Memphis at this point has lots of political activity uh, that's going on. People are very aware of civil rights that's happening at this point. This is the period 1883. The Supreme Court takes away rights uh, again, and there's protest. Uh, and um, the, uh, 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 so, uh, so, and so, and I was very aware of it, and she kind of hangs out with a political, with a, with a, with a political crowd. 
And as many of you know, I'm not going to go into this, but as many of you know, her first act of resistance is refusing to sit uh, in a colored car. That's right. Uh, and uh, is physically extricated from, from the train. Uh, but then she takes the, the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway to court. She wins in the lower court, loses in the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, but at that point, she knows that the law is, as she says, no longer on her side. And it's time to take activism into her own hands. And it's time to think about how to mobilize the community to achieve what needs to be achieved. In 1892, a friend of hers uh, is lynched in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, she was the godmother of his children. Uh, he owned a grocery store. His only crime was to be competitive, economically competitive, with a white proprietor. Uh, and this helps him well to understand that uh, lynching is not what it's being purported to be. It's purported to be as a result of after, uh, after this, uh, black people are freed, and particularly black men, that the first thing they do is want to rape white women. And that they are raping white women. That they're raping it out. It's an epidemic, <laughs> right. An epidemic right. Of, 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 of this. And of course, that's a very <clears throat> useful uh, charge because everybody understands why you might not wait for a court decision Correct. for something that horrible. Correct. Uh, and, uh, <coughs> but she understands with the lynching of Thomas Moss, her friend, that has something else, there's something else going on. It's about economic competition, it's about keeping uh, blacks down. Uh, this is, these are thriving communities in this period, thriving communities. In the I'm going to let you ask some more questions. But in no, the, no, no, please, in the, no. <laughs> the, the election of 1880 in, in Tennessee, 92% of black eligible voters vote. Less than 92% message. vote. And they vote in black legislators who then vote in civil rights bills. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, 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 10 years later, they're, they're, the blacks are disenfranchised. And this, and, this, and this is just a model of what's happening all over uh, the South uh, uh, in, in, in particular. <laughs> so, uh, and so she understands that lynching is about a, a, a social contract that many blacks thought was true, that if we just accumulate wealth, get educated, act like first class citizens, that our first class citizenship is inevitable. Great hope in this period. After all, they were no longer slaves. And as I mentioned, communities thriving, businesses thriving. Uh, one person said so many blacks, it's like a whole race trying to go to school. Blacks going into the schools and becoming literacy drops almost by half in the, in the literacy, which is why you can have black newspapers now in this period. 200 black newspapers being published every week. 200 black newspapers in the 1880s. Which is great. Uh, so, uh, but this uh, uh, has to be stopped. All this has to be stopped. And this is the effort that Wells will spearhead. One of the things that Rose told me to remind everyone is the more, what, what, my, what my thesis is around her life, larger activism is, when you look at, uh, at Wells' strategies, and they were the first to do, she, do certain things that we can talk about. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can make an argument that her anti-lynching campaign is the beginning of the modern civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she's rarely given credit for that. Mm -hmm. we will do that. <laughs> yes, we will. And she's, she's rarely, rarely given credit for a lot. Mm -hmm. And you talked about um, her refusal to give up her seat. So she was Rosa Parks before Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. She was the, you know, she, she, she created or was one of the founders of the Alpha Suffrage Club of Chicago. So she was the, and the National Association of Colored Women. So she was that before ACNW. I mean, there's just so many things this woman is responsible for or helped to influence that none of us know, unless we buy the book. <laughs> so, so with that, I, will, I would also be remiss if I did not say that Ida also talked about, at least in some of her writings, the lynching of Richard Perrier. So there is a tie 
uh, between Ida, even if just by mentioning the, the, the despicable <laughs> act, she did refer to it in one of her early writings. Chris, I wanted to say one thing important yes. about that is that uh, it's really important to understand that, and why she wrote about it, is that lynchings didn't just take place in the South. Right. Mm -hmm. She called it, as you mentioned earlier, a national crime, mm -hmm. which needed, uh, very early on, she wanted federal legislation against mm -hmm. lynching because she says it's a national crime. It's not just the South. And certainly the lynching that you describe uh, is, is evidence of that. Yes, ma'am. So when you think about the, 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 the young age, right, that Ida decided to do all of these things, and certainly, as far as we can tell, there was no one that came before her that inspired her, you would think, other than her parents. That also reminded me of something my grandmother used to say. Okay. <laughs> Which was, you don't have enough sense to be afraid. <laughs> and it's true. She was just headstrong. Her parents were wonderful examples of standing up for themselves and, you know, pressing through despite, you know, clear, clear obstacles. Um, and so, again, there's just so much to admire about her. So as you, well, I just, this, uh, I love it, you know, what attracted me to writing about her was that courage that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, who does that? I mean, right. Who stands up against it? She, and you know, she's tiny, she's like five feet tall. She's there in Memphis, Tennessee. Of all places, right. right. <laughs> and she's going to write anti-lynching, you know, it starts with anti-lynching editorials in the newspaper. Uh, 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 you stand up to that violence. Right. Because some people just can't help themselves. Like, like you said, they just, they just, they, and, and they're daring. Mm -hmm. And they don't think about it. They do it because it's the right thing to do. And, they, and people like that fascinate me because they're driven. Right. They're not thinking, they're not looking to the left or to the right. This is it. Right. Um, and one of my attractions to her is <laughs> Opposites attract. Right, right. You know? yeah. <laughs> 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 I think my head. <laughs> but she just goes, Stop. yeah. I, and I and I love that about her. And of course, she uh, and I love this part about it. You know, she says when she has anti-lynching editorials, mm -hmm. she says, "Why, well, you know, I I bought, a pistol, I bought a pistol." And she said, "Because if they come after me." They get me, but I'm going to take somebody with me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and just one last thing: sure. it's not just physical courage, but she has the courage of her convictions as well, because she is. A, this is a Victorian period when women aren't talking about violence and politics, and she links it all to interracial sex and to se and to, and to rape. Mm -hmm. uh, she's one of the people who even will say the word rape in this period. Mm -hmm. Uh, and she says, she says early on, I'm going to follow this because she figured out the logic of lynching. And she says, I'm going to follow this though the heavens may fall. And they did. Many times <laughs> over. Yeah. But, she, but she's called all kinds of names. You know, transgressive women, women transgress their gender roles. They're always called out about their sexuality, about their morality. Of their mental yeah. fitness. Their mental, yes, yeah, somebody called her crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. She mm -hmm. really was on balance. This is the, this, you know, a lot of us are familiar with all of those charges. But she, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't stop her. And that's as much courage, almost as physical courage to do that. Because when you're kind of thrown out of those societies, uh, or exiled, or, you, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's, very, it's very, very difficult. And she endured a lot of that as well. Well, you talked, you talked at length um, in one of the, interviews that I've seen you give, you give um, about the damage that rumors concerning the reason for Ida's desire to remain living alone following the death of her parents. She has these younger brothers and sisters to take care of. The family wants to separate them. Just, you know, I'll take some. Don't worry. We got this. And no, she's like, no. friends want to separate them. Right. And That's she's like, stuff. and she's like, no, this is a young girl that's saying, no, we're going to, we're going to keep our family together. Um, and so what the, what the rumors did, may have done to her psyche and influenced her activism uh, throughout the years. The default logic for those who saw Ida's motivation to keep the remains of her family intact was to simply prostitute herself to white men at the age of 16. That's the reason why they thought she wanted to remain in town when I believe they saw her accepting payment 
on the corner from a white man, but it, it was something completely different, mm -hmm. completely innocent. But that was the rumor that began to float. Um, can you talk about the hypersexualization of young black women like Ida then, mm -hmm. and you know, obviously now, and what that inner battle for her yeah. might have looked like yeah. and how it scarred her? Right, yeah. and, 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 and let me put some context too. After her parents died, um, there's, there was an association of, of physicians and nurses who would go to different cities, travel with, with, when there were epidemics. So, and, there, and a group had gone to uh, Holly Springs, Mississippi, uh, in the, the epidemic. And remember, they're very frightened of yellow fever. No one understands what causes it yet, or how to, how to cure it. You know. So you know, it's a mosquito. It just goes away during the first frost. Nobody knows why, because mosquitoes die, right? But so, so, um, uh, and on her father's deathbed. Her father is taken care of by a physician, and he says, and I, I, I is not at home at this point. She's with her grandmother out in the country, outside of Holly Springs. And her father says to the physician, I'm, I'm going to give you my money to give to the children, to take care of the children. And that's what he does. So the physician, this is the white man who, she, she, the, report her taking money from right. is the physician. Wow. Now, people are already angry at her because friends of the family, it, 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 a lot of them with lots of goodwill, were going to want to split up the children. But they wanted to use the boys as apprentices. You knew that. She had a sister who was bent almost double from a spinal problem. Nobody wanted that child, going to take that child. And I was supposed to fend for herself at, at 16. Right. Right. So I just said, uh, and she insists on taking the family to herself and staying with the family alone with them uh, in the community. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, so a rumor arises <coughs> after this, this uh, about that she wanted to stay there by herself with the family and not split them up uh, because she wanted to get money from white men. And, you know. and she says uh, with this, she says, you know, the misconstruction of in her autobiography of this what, what was the most, it was the craziest, she didn't say crazy, she said much more elegant. But it was, she said, I've never felt anything like this before as a result of that, what it did to her. And this is after she'd write all back, after she'd deal, dealt with lynchings and everything else, but this thing. Um, and these rumors really sort of stayed with her um, uh, for, for years and years and years. They love to bring you down. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame. Mm -hmm. and, and part of it, as you mentioned, is the, how do we know the stereotypes of hypersexualization? Uh, in fact, the reason why men were thought to be black men hypersexual because the women were hypersexual. I mean, the root is, you know, women are supposed to regulate male behavior. That's why they're supposed to act a certain way. That's why they're supposed to dress a certain way. That's right. To regulate male behavior. Uh, and so when women are so-called lascivious, et cetera, et cetera, that means the men will be. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, and of course, this has been ever since the first travelers went to Africa and saw uh, uh, African women, these ideas. In Western culture, mm -hmm. difference always has an implication of difference in sexuality mm -hmm. and hypersexuality of the other. Mm -hmm. You think about it almost every, not just like, any time there's mm -hmm. a, a difference of another group, right. there's always a sexual mm -hmm. uh, sexuality so, so this was also uh, uh, true, and this is one of the things Ida wants to unpack why she goes after lynching, because if you unpack the hypersexuality of black men, mm -hmm. you're unpacking the hypersexuality of, of black women. And she's and she's able to attack many things within this umbrella of lynching. That's right. That's right. So now I want to talk to you about the political power um, of strategic protest, which I. I'm a big fan of. <laughs> um, I don't want to. Yeah. 
I had once led successful boycotts of trolley cars in Memphis, Tennessee, and fully grasped the ability of African Americans to cripple businesses and even economic se sectors with boycotts, then versus what we don't see now. And that is unity and the willingness to work together for our common good. Can you talk about what it had, what, what, why, excuse me, it would have potentially been easier then versus now? Why is it so much, why is it so much more difficult now when we, when we, when we have more mobility, more freedom, more access to these things, right? We have, we just have a, a greater capacity to, to protest and rebel, but yet it seems like we just want to go about our way and, you know, there's a whole <laughs> pursuit of respectability which you've talked about. Why do you think it was easier then versus now? Well, I'd like to hear uh, actually your answer to that question as well, so, so, so on the ground and very active in, in this. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, those things that you mentioned that Ida did, this is one reason why I talk about that at the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, this is a time, this is the first time that there's a great deal of urbanization in the country, like people coming to the cities. So you have, this is a time of industrialization coming up. And this is a time when black workers are really needed. Right? In these. And so I just thought was that because the South particularly needed these workers, that this was a time for grassroots and civil disobedience. And, and, and that's, how, that's how you mobilize. Uh, she was, most leaders, vehemently dis black leaders disagreed with this strategy. They were afraid of grassroots, the unkempt grassroots people. <laughs> they believed that, and I'm overgeneralizing it, but, but that the elites should lead the town to Kent, the boys' town. Mm -hmm. The elites should lead this, lead this thing. You know, the unwashed masses, not so much. Right. But I just said, that's ridiculous. We need, this is the time when you can actually use, and she used it with a trolley, with it. She, she led a, 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 a 1892, after the lynching of Thomas Moss, and they don't bring anybody to a justice, she leads a trolley car strike in Memphis, in which it almost uh, 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 bankrupts, the, 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 almost bankrupts the company. The company people come to her and beg her to please continue have that black street by the trolley car. So Ida was Ida was Martin Luther King she before, was, before, Martin, before, before Martin Luther King. She was Rosa before Rosa yes, she Martin was. Was. Before yes, she was. Yes, she was. Then she said, this is why she was, and she knew this is really why she was run out of town. Uh, then she said, um, uh, in her first editorial after the lynching of Thomas Moss, who very dramatically, before he dies, and says, Tell my people to go west. There is no justice for them here in Memphis. This is a time when Oklahoma lands are opening up, including black towns are being established in Oklahoma, all black towns. Uh, and uh, she reiterates those words in the ed editorial. And all of a sudden, black people stop leaving Memphis with everything that they have. And the, 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 the newspapers describing hundreds, thousands of people on the piers, taking, getting ready, taking a steamboat to, to Arkansas and then, and then the train to Oklahoma. 20% of the black population leaves Memphis on her word. And as she says gleefully in her autobiography, uh, you know, the blacks had done, had, had stuff, bought a lot of stuff on layaway, they're gone now. <laughs> restaurants are closing. Black people love to go to restaurants. Restaurants are closing. The music stores are closing. Right? People can't find. The, the women are upset that their domestic workers are gone. Like, why would? And so, um, and as a result, there's a kind of a change, not justice, but a change of heart. They give. Thomas Moss, the man who was lynched, mm -hmm. his widow, some money, the city government. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right. And leaders try to come together and create some peace. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, now, um, I think you can make.
make arguments that there's different kinds of mobilizations now. Mm -hmm. Certainly Black Lives Matter. I mean, it's the biggest movement. But it, it did yeah. inspire the young people. Um, and I would agree. I think that one of the reasons, and I'll be brief, I think that one of the reasons why we struggle to do it now is just because we do have more now, right? And so we're, we're, we're a lot more relaxed. But I also think that you know, when you look at Ida's time versus now, there was no shortage of information coming from different types of black people about different types of things. And I think just the failure for us to consume, right, the thoughts and words of our own people and be reminded um, of the power that we possess through the lack of education in our schools, through mm -hmm. the fact that we don't have history books mm -hmm. that really speak to, you know, McGraw-Hill has done a terrible job, mm -hmm. right, in informing our children of our accomplishments as well as, you know, some of our struggles. I think that we are just caught up in this capitalistic, you know, system of survival. Um, and when you're trying to survive, uh, you don't want to rock the boat. You don't want to, you know, put, put your family or yourself in jeopardy. And I think that that is a mistake sometimes. I think, as you pointed out, um, they do understand when things are taken away, as you know, as the system likes to take away its strength as a means of control. And so they understand when their money goes away, <laughs> right? They understand that, and that's the language that they speak. And so economic boycotts and things, and things like that really are important. Yeah, so. And, 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 the, and the black community now is more diverse you know, someone said, I think only, so people have different interests. It's mm -hmm. not as easy sure. to get the same. Uh, uh, someone uh, heard that four out of, now four out of every 10 people of African descent are no longer the people who are in the South of the Great Migration and come. They're, 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 there's Af uh, African immigrants, mm -hmm. there's, you know, people from the Caribbean, there's mm -hmm. a, uh, so four out of ten do not do they do like Obama? They don't have the, the story, the yeah, narrative. They don't relate of coming. Well, they, right, but they just but, but you have to keep negotiating within as well as negotiating across. Right. So uh, uh, yeah. So that I think that's a factor too. Okay. Um, so we will now talk about the NAACP <laughs> and the excommunication of a factor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very dramatic. <laughs> <My> questions. <laughs> So historically, it appears that a large segment of the population of blacks were reticent to embrace the organization, possibly by having whites as founders, albeit abolitionists, and possibly by it taking decades to have a black man lead the organization. But most certainly, a long-standing criticism that lingers today is the belief that they are, they meaning the NAACP, are slow to anger and perceived, and they have a perceived preference to proceed along the lines of least resistance. Can you talk about the beginning of the end of the relationship between Ida and the NAACP? <laughs> as well as the, and, I, and I'll jump in as well, yes. as well as the irony of her erasure by the organization when looking at their campaigns in support of black women today, like Kamala Harris and so on and so forth. Tell us a little bit about the history of the NAACP and how, how that came to begin and end rather quickly. Well, when the NAACP first when there's the first call for, for people to come together in a, in a new organization that comes in the wake of the Springfield, Illinois riots of 1908, which are horrendous riots. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what we don't understand about riots, I mean, there's the deaths, I think 16, at least 16 black people were killed, but they wipe out the black community. They wipe out the middle class black community, particularly, and the entire black community. People have to flee. People in other cities will not accept them. They are, it is just, just horrendous. And she wants to start an organization too, a uh, local one that she does in Chicago. She's in Chicago at this point. Uh, and, but when, the, when Oswald Garrison Villard, an editor, white editor, a number of these NAACP people who were, were socialists and social workers, white, uh, when he says we need a call, she's ecstatic because it's also a symbol that they're going to move away from Booker T. Washington's accommodationist policies. Mm -hmm. uh, she's, she and Mary Church Terrell are the only people, who, only black women who answer the call. Uh, and there is a meeting in New York uh, soon afterwards. At, 
that meeting I just is when I think you quoted it when she says mm -hmm. Then she is a national crime meeting that she she thought this was the vehicle. Right, this is it. Because of all the resources that it commanded, mm -hmm. because many of the individuals were wealthy, they were what they called neo abolitionists. They were very they were progressives. Um, they were also very influential mm -hmm. in their very different influential arenas, in their, right? Different, in, their, in their different, yeah. uh, and, uh, and including social scientists. And this is the first time that social scientists and now Franz Boas. Is one of the people who comes to one of the first meetings, and, and anthropologists who are saying black people are not inherently inferior, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so, but she begs them to support anti lynching legislation. And they will not. Now, and this is where the problem, I think it symbolizes what a lot of people feel is challenging about the NAACP. Is because they were afraid that it was unconstitutional to call for a federal. But you know, activists say, unconstitutional, come on, who cares? Who cares? Exactly. You know, but they were very, very, they were very cautious, cautious uh, organization. The second thing about the NAACP was that it really demanded respectability. They did not, they only took up the cause of people who had unblemished <laughs> reputations, right. yeah. no matter what good other things they, yeah. they had done. Which, yeah. if I could interject, yes. talks about it, that kind of coincides with Rosa Parks Part and the fact that they, you know, chose yeah. her yeah. rather than yeah. the young woman, yeah. the young pregnant woman before her, yeah. right, that, that mm -hmm. refused to give up her Sim seat. Symbolic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and so, and, and this would frustrate Ida, because Ida, again, believes in a grassroots, and she also believes that this respect she thought respectability was fine, but she didn't think it was an agent of change. Activism is the agent of change. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Right. And so, and, but many people felt activism took away your respectability. Right. Mm -hmm. and that you can look good. Really you can look good in protests. You know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> right. So it was a really. Uh, uh, she really had a very different philosophy, and of course, that's the philosophy we think of now. That's what I'm saying. This is the foundation of the modern ways of looking at. Uh, 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 of civil rights. Mm -hmm. Then there is the uh, problem. She would actually have competitive, there'd be an issue. They dispatched the NAACP lawyers, et cetera. And I would go, because they all trap, would go to, and she would set up a, 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 a competitive organization to, to deal with the issue and, com and competitive fundraising to the NAACP. And the NAACP often would have, um, what do you call it when you, um, with money and then, you have, you have to raise a certain amount of money and then somebody would come in and, and all the matching, matching, matching donations. Because a lot of white benefactors wouldn't give money right away, but they would give you matching money. Mm -hmm. So the NAACP, because they wanted to see that you could raise it from first. Right, right. And, and they couldn't, because I was raised it. <laughs> <over here. laughs> So there, was, so there was a lot of uh, uh, competitiveness, but at, at, the, at bottom is this, though. At the bottom is, uh, I was more radical than they were. And they just couldn't abide by her leadership ideas of every, you know, of, of bottom up versus uh, uh, a top down. But interestingly enough, you know, after she goes, they somehow awaken. They have this great awakening, right, to, to the to the lynching campaign, well, and use that to their financial advantage as well as a they, lot of other. They can't get traction among black people mm -hmm. for many, for a long time, until they adopt. Guess what? Lynching as their center. She kept telling she begging them. rapidly, right? Yeah. And, and finally, they do it under black leadership, uh, and then. Uh, the NAACP becomes a viable organization because, and not just lynching, but this is when black women join the NAACP in large numbers. And they are opening chapters all over the country, including in the South, where it's dangerous. They send women to open these, these chapters. Uh, so then it becomes viable. Then the competition is who is going to control the lynching discourse? 
and Ida will eventually lose out because the NAACP becomes this huge organization uh, with many, many resources. I, I do think, I mean, and Krista and I were talking about this a little earlier, that there is a role for organizations like the NAACP with that caution and with that, there's a role there. The civil rights, you know, a lot of people would still be in jail. The NAACP wasn't getting them out of jail. Correct. They have to pass it because it's a legal defense fund. But they're passing important laws. So, I, so, and you have to have a certain stance to do, be able to do that. The thing is that that becomes the only organization. Correct. What happens with, with black, blacks here often is that there's only one on top. And the others become diminished instead of working in, you know, together. But you need NAACP and the Civil Rights Movement. You needed a SNCC, you know, you needed Malcolm, you needed, right. you know, you needed, you needed all, and they balanced it. And at one point, when everybody, when all cylinders were going, it was the most effective period. The problem, though, I think we run into with these organizations is that people just won't stay in their lane. Like you said, they, everybody, they, they want to master every domain and run everything. And so my dream is that I wish the NAACP and the Urban League and all these other large organizations would get together and sit down and say, okay, you're going to handle voting? <laughs> and focus just on that, right? Not be the king of all things yeah. civil rights. Yeah. You're going to handle, you know, the injustices. Yeah. You're going to handle economic empowerment. And then if we all just focused on these one things and stay in our lane, we might be able to accomplish more, but that's just my dream. Good idea. <laughs> I'm voting for you. <laughs> so, um, the book tells us um, about a time when Ida was invited to Washington, D.C. by Frederick Douglass to speak, and he ends up serving as a mentor to her father, the loss of her father, you, you mentioned that as well. And yet, only he and his family were in the audience to listen when she came to speak. <laughs> it seems the truth tellers. That's not going to be too. Yeah. Not good for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not that I was in here. Uh, I know that feeling. Mm -hmm. It seems the truth tellers women truth-tellers, and especially black women truth-tellers, seem to have difficulty garnering support from the very folks they fight for. And one, one comment that uh, a Bishop Kenneth Pierman had said to me one day, I was, he's, he's like a mentor to me and I, he counsels me a little bit sometimes when I'm on, when I'm, you know, on the ledge. And uh, he said, the work that you do is valuable, but the work, that you, the work that you do is thankless because, not about the thanks, and that wasn't my argument, but he was just reminding me giving me a bigger picture. He said, it's thankless because most of the people that you help, you will never know or see. And the people that benefit from what you're doing, a lot of them will never know or see you either. Mm -hmm. But the work is still that important. So with that, do you, pers do you personally identify with that statement about being a truth teller or the work that you've done and feeling as though you were, didn't quite get on <laughs> Noted question. <laughs> tell, tell me about it. Uh, uh, I told you I was going to throw something in there. You sure, 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 sure I did. I, and, I, and I really mean this. I'm not just being, you know, goody goody. Uh, I, I have been very fortunate in uh, of, 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 of people being very supportive and, and helpful. But you know, I also have a different situation. I'm a writer. You know, yeah, right, 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 right. I know, and I, and I, and, and there are, but there, of course there have been, and you know, it, it's sometimes it's now a cliche. Uh, and of course there have been people who have undermined the, the, me and, and who have kept me from getting things that I should have or could have gotten. Um, and, 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 but I said, but, but I believe in the cliche, if nobody's against you, then you're not doing your job. Amen. So, uh, and I try to be like Ida Wells. I try to be like, if it's right, do it. Uh, what is that? Someone just quoted me recently, and I'm not going to remember it well, but the, 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 uh, the, 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 the Roman philosopher Seneca said, um, it's, it's not that, is that when you dare, things are not really that difficult. I mean, it's not, this is a really poor translation of it. It's like, uh, things are difficult because you don't dare, right? Mm -hmm. But if you dare, you know, uh, and you just have to go forward. And you just feel so much better. You begin hips out of the head. 
You, just, you feel so much better if you're going forward and listening to your to thine own self be true. Mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to being true to yourself. You have to be. There's nothing worse than not being true to yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, I write the books I want to read, but me, I think it's important. I do the things that I didn't, you know, the Academy, the academy hates biographies. They don't, understand, they don't understand where to put biographies. You know, I had a higher power to deal with, you know what I mean? Right. And I, and I thought this, this, this biography was, uh, this, bio, this, this, this was important. Um, uh, but even in my classes, it was hard to talk about. Now, you know, kids, you gotta go to the dean if you're gonna talk about something like lynching, you gotta get experienced. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get special stuff and all that. People are talking about violence. I, I tell them what. Suppose you were the victim. Why would you talk about? You can't read about this. Yeah. So uh, you, you know. So it's. Um, but that is. And I want to get off myself. That is though the what every truth teller has to deal with. And it's great to have examples like what Ida Wells because she withstood so much to tell, to tell that, to tell that truth, you know. Uh, and um, uh, but but that is that is that is the lesson. Listen, you have to dare. You have to do what is what you, what, what's needed um, because otherwise it's just like a social death. I mean, it's, you know, it's just you just become nothing. Uh, and so, but it's great to have examples, and it's great to have support. It's so important to have support systems. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to do all this stuff all by yourself. You know, so. Okay. So, <clears throat> you wrote the book about I don't want to quote her things. So we'll talk about what her things were. Mm -hmm. um, what we would not call her flowers, of course. Um, when we look at all that Ida accomplished, and this is just, this is really just, a, this is a, I'm, I'm losing my mind in this moment. What? You know when the question already has the answer. Oh, Thank you, ladies. <laughs> having, having a senior moment. Um, <laughs> um, so when we look at all that Ida accomplished, all the ground she broke, all the firsts, and so on, which we only kind of you know broke, touched the surface on. Why do we still to this day, with all of the technology and all of the access, why do we know so little about her? And but why is it also that we often hesitate to celebrate the ones who do get the job done? Um, and also add in a little bit about the purposeful omission of her contributions by folks like Carter G. Woodson um, and other actors. Mm -hmm. Minimizing her value, her power, and her purpose. And I think that's, and maybe that's it. The intent is to minimize the value, power, and purpose of individuals who go against the grain, individuals who may have thought of it before you, individuals who are willing to do what you may only dream of doing. And even though you might be happy that they're doing it, you still go like, oh. <laughs> I could have done that, right? Yeah. Or, or here she comes. <laughs> There's so many reasons why she has difficulties. You know, she uh, she started her autobiography just a, a couple of years before she died uh, because she knew if she didn't say anything, it wasn't going to be said. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact, I mean, when you do the research on her, she mm -hmm. is a leading figure of the 19th century. She's in all the newspapers, all across the country, white and black, you know. When Frederick Douglass dies in 1895, it really should have been Ida who emerges mm -hmm. as the, the major race leader. But as we know, we talk about the competition between Du Bois and Washington. We don't see, we don't see, 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 uh, see Ida. Uh, she's an extraordinary figure in Chicago as well. Uh, Actress, as you mentioned, the first black women's suffrage organization, Ida. She's the reason why black women begin to get elected in Illinois. She's a reason that she that 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 Chicago machine is just extraordinary. It still is. Still is. It's no coincidence that Obama mm -hmm. and the first woman senator, uh, Carolyn Monroe, come out of, out of Chicago mm -hmm. because of this the, the power of that machine. She's one of the reasons for that power, and she genders that machine. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, 
And yet she uh, understood that she better write her own autobiography. <laughs> and after she wrote it, her daughter edited it uh, and started trying to get it published like in 1833, 1933. Mm -hmm. And it takes another 40 years before the autobiography is published. Wow. It's only published because John Hope Franklin, the historian at the University of Chicago, he has a series of black autobiographies. And he includes the Crusade for Justice, Ida's autobiography. So what is the, what, what is, what is the, the reason for her? There's lots, look, we know racism, we know the usual. Uh, problems, racism, sexism, blah, 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 uh, uh, patriarchy, women are not supposed to speak for the race. Still, they can speak, but they don't speak for the race. That's a problem with her and Douglas, so we can talk about that later, later on. Um, but, but I'll tell you what I think the worst thing was, and it's painful. We love to blame all the other stuff on the outside. But it's, it's why the progressives themselves didn't like her. And it's the progressives who are writing that history. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and the progressives, white and black, mm -hmm. did not like her point of view, uh, did not like her leadership ideas, did not like the radicalism. You know, when the NAACP begins to dominate the lynching discourse, they take out the sex part. Just talk about the violence, and Ida says, "But you don't understand. Mm -hmm. It's unpacking that sexuality issue, which unpacks those stereotypes, and unpack, you know, and unpacks the uh, the lack of humanity people are projecting on black people, which allows them to get killed. Mm -hmm. So you've got to put this in. They they take it out because it becomes too too controversial. Uh, people like the du, du Bois just don't like her." He just doesn't like her. Uh, she is older than he is. When she starts, when she finishes, when she starts an anti-lynching campaign, he's still in Europe. He's not even around. And she made a remark that he didn't care for either. No, she, <laughs> Booker T. Washington hated her. That's what Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Oh, oh, Booker T. Uh, what was the remark? I'm sorry. What was the remark? I believe it was a remark about, about Washington. I think Let's help the little man, or something to that. I'm well, paraphrasing. Well, listen, what 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 she would Booker T. Washington would say things like, you know, no 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 uh, graduate of Tuskegee ever got lynched. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. it's the criminals and the bad folks that get lynched. Mm -hmm. Right. And that is a very, uh, that's a real ideological split. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying just the opposite. Yeah. It's the middle class who have property. <laughs> it's people who are refused to be repressed. And those are the people who are getting it. But Booker, but this respectability. Right. Uh, uh, and it's not just, it's, and that stuff isn't superficial. It really delves deep into, we know Booker T is the most powerful, he's probably the most powerful black leader in the history of it still of the country. He commands resources from all the philanthropists. He's building this institution. And the and all the philanthropists are very patronizing. And they want this these this good this good kind of Negro. Uh, 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 and one who will just be a part of the industrial complex without complaining. One thing he would say, you know, black people will never strike on you. They'll hire us. They'll hire immigrants from abroad who will strike and cause trouble. Hire black people. We're, we, we promise you that we're not. We're going to. We're going to behave ourselves. Mm. I don't want to use the working class to rebel. <laughs> Complete difference, and what they're and how they're thinking about it. So those are very powerful. Then there are other things to be honest. I was very, and I know people call it difficult, but I didn't even take that to I was difficult. You know, she calls people out publicly. She, she doesn't play well with others. 
In fact, it was Andrew Young who made an interesting statement once. He said, he says, you know, oppression creates strong women mm -hmm. and weaker men. Mm -hmm. now, this is that. Andrew Young said this. <laughs> but it, I don't know if it's about weaker men, but it, it certainly, it, it does create stronger women. <coughs> and this complicates gender relationships because we, you know, I, one thing I say, you know, black people, you know, I'm not sure we've had a sexual revolution really in dealing with un understanding about equality and gender roles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, and so one on top will order somebody else is on, on top instead of it. Uh, and so the strength of women uh, is, is a very complicated, it's one that we celebrate it all the time that we should, but it complicates a lot of things. And so, uh, uh, and now Ida though, when Ida was talking about it, remember this is a Victorian period when white men are like killing people because they're supposed to be protected women, right? right? We know that was not the real reason, but that's what they're saying, mm -hmm. protecting white womanhood. And so, uh, uh, and, and she, but she is saying she really wants men to fight. She says, well, where is it on the other side? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and she gets into trouble with, uh, one time, uh, uh, you know, her her, uh, uh, her newspaper is being published inside of the church in the beginning, uh, and uh, there is a incident in Georgetown, Kentucky, where a black man was lynched, and black men in response burned down the entire town. <laughs> We don't hear about these. Those are the in the history book. That's right. They, burn, they almost burned down the entire town mm. of Georgetown in, in response and revenge. And Wells says in so many words, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, find the men of God, like men and they wiped it. She said, if we have to burn down a thousand towns to deal with the, to, you saw the lynching, then we have to do it. Well, the church gets upset. The church <laughs> Because, because people, black people are also always afraid with good reason that th these kinds of words is going to bring about their it's own destruction. Right, right. <laughs> and so here they are. So I said, oh Lord, no, she didn't say that. But it's the conundrum of we don't do something. Mm -hmm. that you, yeah. Right, it's that cycle, the right. <laughs> this stuff is very hard. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy to be, including myself, being critical, be critical. It's very easy to be critical of people, but this stuff is really hard. Mm -hmm. So so they have to meet me. The newspaper has to get uh, thrown out of the church. Uh, and uh, they, they go to Beale Street uh, uh, in, in the newspaper offices. So there's this, this is conundrum, as you say, with, with, with African Americans mm -hmm. uh, of fearful, <clears throat> not just 
is for the it's not the lack of personal courage, but fearful for what's going to happen to the group. But it's already happening. Right. And that's the piece. That's, that's, that's <laughs> exactly. Fearful is something that's, that's already occurred. That's, saying. that's, what, she's, that's mm -hmm. what she's saying. It's mm -hmm. already that the, that's you know, it's the wrong social contract. Right. Mm -hmm. That you know, being nice is not going to get you where you think it's going to get you. Yes. My work is done. <laughs> Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so that that is that not the song? Oh, you just oh, 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 oh I thought you were just I thought you were just no, 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 no. I was ready to go get a drink. <laughs> <laughs> this actually, this actually is the last question for my work. Okay. Yeah. So so that is the song that Ida chose. She asked that we played at her funeral. Mm. Uh, my work is done. Mm. Uh, and with all the controversy and all the things we talked about. That church was full to the rafters, and people were outside. As they should have been. All outside. And, and uh, uh, I played when I, when I read that at the funeral day, she requested my work is done. And I listened to Mahalia Jackson mm -hmm. do my work is done. Google. Right. Google it. Yeah. It will take with my hand. It does that. Oh. Uh, that's, that's spiritual. Um, and so it was just the right. And what I liked about it too is that Wells understood her work. That despite it wasn't it wasn't finished, but it was done. Amen. You know. Uh, and she she had done all that she could do. A lot of her contemporaries who compromised. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they had to, but they compromised. And they did not live good. The end of their lives were not good. Uh, the great Monroe Trotter was one of my favorite activists. Uh, you know, commit suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, T. Thomas Fortune becomes an alcoholic. Uh, uh, a, a number of them fall, uh, of her contemporaries fall ill. Uh, and um, she, though, um, you know, uh, really, and a lot of them quit and become, it's a, it's a very difficult period because the radicals are taken over by the Booker T. Washington ideology. It's very hard to fuck it. Um, but she just never stops. Uh, and, and, and and so, um, uh, but she dies in a way, you know, she died a year after she ran for a state senate seat. <laughs> yeah. She ran, she lost, she ran as an independent. Mm -hmm. Oh, what else? Right. right. <laughs> uh, and uh, loses terribly. The next day, she brings in her fortune, she said, okay, we're going to do it, okay, this is how we're going to do it next time. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. you know. It's the middle of a depression. She decides she's going to publish a new newspaper. In the middle of a depression. <laughs> she just does and stuff. And uh, uh, so, so in her, she had done, I think, knew what she, she, she did what she had what she set out to do. It wasn't all that. There was still much to be done and not all. Of it. But she had done what she set out to do. And what a satisfying, I wish that on all of us. I wish that on all of us. At the end of our days, we say, you know, we did it. We did. I did everything I could do, uh, and I and I and I feel fulfilled by that. And I think she did. Well, that's my question for you. No. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> when your work is done, and we hope it's not for a long, long time. It's not good. Not too much. <laughs> what would what What do you want people to remember about? Well, you? no. I. You know. Your work. My, 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 my work. My work is period. The best thing that happens to me is when people say, um, you know, I learned something. This changed me. Um, I've got to have inspiration. I mean, even little things. A, a student came to me and said, you know, I got a, um, I, I got a, a scholarship to, to uh, study in, in England. And I, I'm going to turn down because I'm afraid I've never been out of the country. 
She said, but if I knew I was going to take an anti-lynching campaign, I'd be able to study in England, and she went. So, uh, so that's 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 that, that that that's it. That's my, you know, mm -hmm. if that, that that everything that you uh, sacrifice and all is, is, is just me. Ladies and gentlemen. tri-state area, primarily one in the Bronx. They're all deemed as suicides. suicides. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that were reported, that we heard about, and I'm sure there's more. So what are your thoughts? 2020, we had four men lynched right in front of the city hall, in Manhattan. In Parson, in public, right? right in public, right? Mm -hmm. Young men, black men, that's important to say. And 2020, primarily three weeks after George, the murder of George Floyd. I'm just trying to figure out, like, it's still going on. Like, what are your thoughts? You know, it, it, this is going to be a little bleak way to say it because we, it's obviously horrifying and frustrating that certain things haven't changed. Well, one thing that would help me to think about things, I have always thought, I know I've always thought, you know, people argue, uh, is there progress or are we going back? And she said, both are happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because she was in the era where there was tremendous, like now, tremendous black progress on lots of fronts. But everything else was getting worse, right? So there was, that's when segregation really starts. This is when mass um, incarceration starts in this period. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, of course, the violence, et cetera. And so we're seeing that same thing now. So that's a way to think about what's going to me, to, uh, to, 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 to what's going on. Yeah, one of the interesting lines of a, uh, a black woman historian on slavery said, it always stuck with me, she says, you know, the essence of slavery is containment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's now, it's the essence of black relations now. It's containment. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever you go beyond a certain thing, which, is, which deals with voting, deals with that, because I always said, why do police have to shoot people running away? Mm -hmm. Containment, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and uh, uh, so, so this is what we have to, you know, how, I think one way to, to, to think about how we have to struggle with, to struggle with, with that. And so we have to understand, of course, there are all kinds of efforts, good efforts, unprecedented efforts, you know, with the legal system and the justice system that's happening on one level. But on the other level, there's more and more people are being caught in containment. You know? Self-containment. Right, and self-containment. You know, inner cities are contained. That's contained, you know? You know? Uh, and so, uh, which were, if you read the literature, on, it, uh, they're so deliberately constructed in the city, so deliberately constructed, it does not have no happenstance of that people happen to be because they're poor in the area. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is federal, state, and local legislation and zoning and everything else that creates these, mm -hmm. uh, these entities. And so that's what we have to sort of, you know, get to, I think, get to those fundamentals. Um, so so it's, it's, it's just, but that's what, you know, it's uh, it's just so it's just it's just it's, it, it, it's just a horrible thing. We just have to keep that. As I we just have to keep fighting. So my question centers more around the economic power and boycott. I've been a big firm believer that that is one of the venues that we don't do anymore, and we definitely don't do it as far as what corporate responsibility and industry can do for us. So what are your thoughts on 
how do we change the tide to put a little bit more focus? Because I fully believe if we just kept our money, some mm -hmm. of these things would just not so much dissolve, but the eyes would really be upon, like, like Ida did, like we did in the, vo in the boycotts in the South, I think. So what are your thoughts on how we can get back to that? Or do you think it's still viable? I, uh, yes, I think, it's, I think it's, it's viable. And I think now there, but I think we have to modernize some of our methods and we get to know, know more, more about this. Because the, you know, inside corporations are these affinity groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're black affinity groups, there's women's affinity groups, there's now other people of color, other things. And I think those are good targets to start trying to control some of these economic issues that you're talking about and you're making corporations respond in a particular way. Not just from the outside, but uh, from the inside. And a number of, I've talked to affinity groups and they're very interesting. And they have, and they have power within uh, these corporations that, uh, uh, that's easy, much easier to mobilize than people uh, outside of it. But as far as I know, economic boycotts have always been effective. They, you know, there was a lot of them during the Depression. Don't buy where you, you know, where they, where they will uh, employ you, et cetera, et cetera. But the other thing is more complicated now. Um, because everybody's claiming diversity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds uh, bad. Some, somebody <laughs> has said uh, diversity has taken the place of justice. People are assuming justice when it's just diversity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. Right. And so it's harder to convince, you know, it's, it's easy, but it's much it's easier, at least intellectually, when, when the store won't hire black people, and so you boycott them and all. But what are you going to do when you have all these uh, uh, companies and all these other entities who have this, all this complicated diversity stuff? And I used to tell Smith, I said, you know, you don't need all, that, all these programs, implicit bias programs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just do the right thing. Yeah. Just hire some. <laughs> And sometimes maybe I, I'm too ra too rational about things, but there, if we understand it better, you know, I have a friend uh, who is she's actually uh, in the East Asian, the South Asian, uh, and when I hear her talk about what she does and stuff, she's she's fun. She's you know kind of a daredevil. And it it makes me sometimes I realize how how being black makes you so much more cautious about certain things. Mm -hmm. right. 
You can I mean, yeah. doing it to yeah. yourself even right. before anything. Yeah. Yeah. Anything yeah. is really yeah. moving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. So, you know, one time she, she was laughing. She was in a drive in a car and she didn't have a license or registration. <laughs> and he stops her. And she then she ends up inviting the policeman to lunch. And, uh, you know. I said, I said, you know, I remember being stopped by a policeman and uh, for speeding in North Carolina. And his chest was heaving. I mean, it was so much, he had so much adrenaline, you know? And he had, you know, those big hassles, hassles with people. And he had, I mean, the last thing I would think of was, you know, I had a little bit of a but we have, but we, that's not the best thing, but, but there are just little things that people, that people who aren't like, could do, and just, and you'd say, could you hear your mother say, no, come on, don't do that. You know, don't whatever, are you crazy? Yeah, yeah. 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 And you think, what well, all the consequences. So, but it's hard because, you know, that, that saying, um, uh, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean that they're, they're not after you. Yeah. Right, that's right. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, but, but, but we have, but we do have to, I think it's very healthy to recognize it just as you recognize it and to begin to try to, to, to confront it, you know? Because not confronting is worse than anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some people just don't know. There's, some, mm -hmm. there's so many mistakes people make because nobody told them not to do it, mm -hmm. you know? It's a, a friend of mine uh, wrote a book called Rosalie Leon Dash. She won a Pulitzer Prize for it. He was, he was uh, uh, tracing of black women, black family right. in inner city Washington. Uh, and Rosalie was a hard working, she was a waitress, uh, a hard working couple of jobs, had four children. Uh, and one day, somebody uh, that she's serving as a waitress in the restaurant says, well, Why don't you just try this? And so it was crack. Oh. And she's, no one just like said, like, Don't do that. She's, well, okay. So her life changes. She becomes a drug addict. She becomes a thief. She has trouble with the kids. She prostitutes. You know, they get my, you know what I mean? All that stuff is nobody just said. You know, like Tony Morrison used to say, and everybody used to has you have also have their friends to help you with this. Tony Morrison used to say, somebody should have told Anna Krenna to get away from that. To get away from those tracks. <laughs> teach other next generation particularly mm -hmm. not to in ways mm -hmm. but we have to be conscious of it because so much of it is just I think it's so inbred and it's and it's a result of generations of experience. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in on one? Yes please. Okay. If I may I just would like to add to that and say we also need to feel and be empowered and understand that voting in the proper people to mm -hmm. get the type of results we're looking for it is a marathon. It is not a sprint. It is not a one time I voted, mm -hmm. why isn't everything fixed, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have term limits in Congress. We don't have term limits in many cases on the state mm -hmm. level. So you have the same people with the same ideals reigning for decades. That's the impediment really to our progress. And so I think if we all just make sure that one person we knew understood mm -hmm. that we vote every year consistently and we vote in our best interest, not according to what someone told us we should mm -hmm. be doing, mm -hmm. we would have less of what, what you're seeing because we would have legislation like we finally got after mm -hmm. Ida started the work, right? We just got the federal anti lynching yeah. yeah. We yeah. just yeah. got yeah. Yeah. So that to me is, is the second part. So I'm ready, sir. Can I just add to that? Yes, please. Can we start, can you start an organization called After the Vote? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because we vote and then we go home. Mm, we yeah. can. And no, no, it doesn't do it. And then the lobbyists come in and do whatever. Thank you. Right. Yep. right. And that's the way, way the world works. We shouldn't be angry at that's the way the world works. But let's talk about after the vote and keep people, keep them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right right you know, right. right. We also have one that says before the vote, and before the vote, we go to them and say, if you do not do X, Y, and Z, we will make sure that X, Y, and Z. The answer, the, the, the answer is never, we're not going to vote. <laughs> okay? The answer is, okay, we got you in here. 
you're going to do this, this, and this, and if you do not, right. we will see to it that you no longer right. have that seat. Yeah. Right. And sometimes you need another group because people are exhausted. Get the ones who got you got you to vote. Right. But that's what I mean. Everybody stayed in their lane. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So thank you all very, very much. and things like that, we can do that right now. At three o'clock will be our next program with Dr. Stephen Frasher, who is here somewhere, was here? Is Stephen here? Oh, he's in the room. Uh, so I urge folks who are interested to stay for that. And your surveys on the program today, if you can complete those, just leave them on the table up here. Now. Yes. Good luck to you. Hey.